there was a guy who testified in a hearing who told on record and said, I'm a medical marijuana patient. I can legally purchase and consume cannabis. He applied for a job through the city of Philadelphia, made it all the way through, but then they said, oh, well, you smoke marijuana, you're not going to pass the drug test, so we can't hire you. But he's legally really? eligible to smoke. Over medical use of it, too. Absolutely. Wow. So how do we make that make sense? It would yeah. never make sense. Hi, I'm Ava with Inside Ambition on Drexel Television. I am thrilled to be here today with Pennsylvania State Representative Amon Brown to discuss some of the most important issues impacting Philadelphia today. We are going to talk about several of Representative Brown's proposed bills and his stances on different topics. Representative Brown, thank you so much for coming in. It is an honor to have you on the show today. Well, thank you for having me. Um, I, am, I am honored to be here representing my community and to, to share how we really feel and what we're going through in mm -hmm. black communities across the country. And I'm so excited to hear everything that you have to share and your stances on different topics. Um, and to start off, it would be great if you would tell us a bit about your background. You've described yourself as a true native of your district as you yes. were born and grew up in West Philadelphia itself. So how did your experiences early on lead you into politics and kind of shape your views? I am, like you said, a native of West Philadelphia. 56 and Market, to be exact. Uh, that is the street corner where I was a victim of gun violence myself, and, and I was arrested on that same street corner wow. myself. Um, and, and by the grace of God, I made it through that, uh, that entire situation. And I am here today representing the families from that same corner um, and from that area and also the families of all of the public schools that I went to, yeah. Hamilton Elementary, Sarah Middle School, which is now high school, and Overbrook High School. So all of those uh, constituents or residents, residents that go to those schools, I, I now represent. I know what it's like to walk to school and live, work, and play in my community. Um, mm -hmm. I've been there all my life. And I ain't going nowhere, you know. So um, the life experiences that I've been through led me here today to be a actual authentic voice for people that look like me and people with a similar background, single mother, um, father incarcerated, mother on drugs, growing up with no food on the table most nights, only attending school just to make sure I ate twice that day wow. the majority of the time. Life was rough, but I wouldn't change not one thing that I went through um, because, again, it, it made me as strong as I am today. And it had, it, I'm here representing the community that made me. You know, mm -hmm. um, I'm thankful for that. My community is thankful to have someone who is from West Philadelphia representing them in Harrisburg. And we continue to, you know, keep going. And I think that's wonderful because people always fear that their politicians are outside of the issues mm -hmm. and kind of looking on the outside in. But you've actually had a lot of these experiences and a lot of these issues that are plaguing Philadelphia today. You've experienced these things yourself. Yes. So I think that's a wonderful thing. And thank you so much for sharing that. No, oh, no, thank you for giving me, you know, giving me the opportunity to let the public know what's really going on. Um, mm -hmm. and, and you hit the nail right on the head. It's. I'm not a elected official that was implanted in my community and then ran for office. I was grown in my community. And that's the yeah. main difference. Um, you know, a, a lot of my constituents, they know me as Little Almond. You know, <laughs> Little Almond went to the store for me, or Little Almond shoveled my snow, or Little Almond painted my house. Little Almond changed my door locks, you know, and then it's like, oh, wow, I can vote for Little Almond, you know, so <laughs> yeah. it's like it was a no brainer. The people got behind me during my election and we sent a message to the entire Philadelphia, to the entire state that it's time to give the power back to the people. Mm -hmm. And 
that's what I'm here to do every single day, every single night. And I'm working hard to represent them to the best of my ability. And we're getting a lot of things done. That's wonderful. And I like that nickname, Little Amen. I think yeah, that's really Amen. lovely. Yeah. Um, and I would like to talk a little bit about your proposed bills, mm -hmm. some agreements you've been involved in to get a sense of your stances on different issues, yes. and also to educate people about the issues that are going on in this city. You have proposed a bill with State Senator Mike Regan to le legalize the use of recreational marijuana in Pennsylvania. Yes. Mm -hmm. And you are at a hearing discussing how the criminalization of weed has mm -hmm. impacted marginalized communities in Philadelphia. So my question from that is, do you believe that our drug laws as they are currently are disproportionately impacting people of color or people of certain communities, and why is that? Absolutely. People of color, black people, we are impacted the most by a lot of the, the laws that are in place in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, and uh, mainly the prohibition of cannabis. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, it, it, it does hurt the black community because we are a product of our environment in some cases, right? So if I am a, a young black male father and I don't have any other access to whether it's furthering my education or getting a good job or whatever the case may be, if all my friends are you know, selling a little weed just to, just to keep the lights on or, or put food on the table, I don't think that someone should be incarcerated for that, you know, because mm -hmm. that's all they know. And we always talk about how black people don't have access, right? So okay. if we don't have access, we have to figure out a way to survive. And mm -hmm. if it's selling some cannabis to feed my family in my community, we're gonna do that. And then when we get caught doing that and then we're taken away from our family, Think of all the trauma that that caused yeah, for selling something that grows out of the ground. Mm -hmm. You know, so and now it's like we already legalized medical marijuana, and all you need is a $200 medical marijuana card to get access to cannabis. And then it's okay. You know, so let's remove that barrier mm -hmm. and make it legal for all adults who want to uh, partake in, in uh, cannabis. And let's help the people who need government the most right now. And that's mainly communities of color. Once we pass this legislation, Senator Mike Regan and I, we're looking at well over 400,000 records expunged for nonviolent drug offenses, right? Wow. Which will instantaneously give access to government assistance, housing, um, access to jobs. That's how we need to view this. We need to take a step back and say, what is this legislation actually going to do? It's going to help people, mainly yeah. people in the black communities who were impacted the most by the prohibition. And do you think there's any truth to the idea, and I've heard this argument a lot, that first of all, of course, um, Weed offenses are punished too harshly, which mm -hmm. is something I personally agree with. And do you think they are taking up time in our courts and our prisons <coughs> that could be dedicated to more serious of offenses? Absolutely. We all know what's going on in our country right now. And we have violent crime in every major city yeah. across the country. My focus right now is my city, Philadelphia. Violent crime is out of control. We need to focus in on violent offenses attempted murders, armed carjackings, robberies, yeah. breaking and enterings, you know, rapes, uh, mm -hmm. aggravated assaults, all of those things, not worrying about somebody trying to make a few bucks to make sure their child don't go to school hungry or to make sure that their child don't go to school looking, looking in a way that they will be made fun of and bullied. You know, these are things that we worry about as black parents. You know, so it's, mm -hmm. in my community, is by any means necessary to make sure my children are okay. My mother did whatever she had to do to make sure there was food on the tables in our household. She did a wide range of things that my siblings and I were not okay with. But I respect her. She did whatever it took to make sure we had something. You know, she, she had a lot of male friends. 
and you know she had to do what she had to do looking back it just makes me appreciate her even more you know because what she did got me here right now we're going through a lot in the black communities and we need authentic representation we need people who have real life experiences not people who read it in a book and not people mm -hmm. who are um, told, oh, look at these bullet points. This is what's happening in the black community. No, I am what's happen happening in the black community. And that's what we need more of, more people who are from the community representing us, whether it's in city council, whether it's in Harrisburg, or whether it's in Washington, D.C. We need authentic representation. Absolutely. And do you see even the legalization of marijuana could that create an industry and kind of business opportunities for people who are already involved in marijuana trade but mm -hmm. are just doing it kind of under the books? Mm -hmm. Is that an opportunity for them to kind of expand the, their business there? Yes, absolutely. So um, we had our first legalization hearing in Harrisburg um, with Senator Mike Regan. He's the chairman of the Law and Justice Committee. Yeah. You know, I testified that the black market, street weed, illicit market, whatever you want to call it, they are keeping up with the times. There is a business, there's a person who created an app who has branding, has jars, a delivery service, you know, a menu when you, when you scan this barcode. Wow. And they deliver it to your doorstep, but it is not a legal entity. So why can't we take that same person who has the know-how to get access to an app, um, have a delivery system in place, branding, mm -hmm. um, an advertisement apparatus that drives in customers, but his paperwork ain't in order. For whatever reason, he decided to go that route. Knowing that that type of individual is out here, why can't we take him and put him in the legal market and help him build something around him to where he can be an example. He, to him, he's an entrepreneur. To me, he's mm -hmm. an entrepreneur. Yeah. So we need to step in and help this man or woman succeed and help them do it the right way. And we have the opportunity here with my, my and Senator Regan's legislation to give access to people like him or her. And so what our legislation will do, it would give 50 plus percent of the licenses made available to minorities or black owned companies, right? We're looking around ownership in the company 66% or more, and not just on paper, but also mm -hmm. benefiting from the, the revenue generated. That's what we need, we need access. A lot of people say, um, or a lot of whoever, um, they always say, it's because of this while, we don't, while we're not moving forward. Well, it, it's, it's partly because of us too. You know, I was dealt the same hand as any black man in West Philadelphia, right? You know, I remember when I first moved to West Philly, we lived in a uh, single family row home. We didn't have heat. We barely had hot water. Um, and we, we, didn't, we didn't have much at all. But my mother met this man and he wanted to do for her and he gave us, he gave us access to a house. And, you know, the experiences that I faced in that house made me as strong as I am. And, you know, just thinking back of what we went through in that house, um, you know, it was some memorable moments. Um, you know, we didn't have access to the opportunities. Um, and now, we have the opportunity here to take people like myself who've been through what I've been through and, you know, right the wrongs and give us access, um, you know, to an industry that impacts us the most. And so when we, when we talk about what we didn't have, I had barriers in my way, but I didn't let that stop me. Mm -hmm. you, know, um, you know, I graduated from Overbrook High School I tried, um, tried college for a year and a half or two, um, but it wasn't for me. And, you know, I decided to become an entrepreneur. And I literally went online 
to figure out how to open a business and start a business. And I followed the steps that were online. No barriers were put in my way. Yeah. And if I did reach a small hurdle, I figured out a way to solve that problem. And then I became a very successful entrepreneur. As a black man from 56 and Market, there was no racism involved. No one told me, oh no, you're black and you can't do this. No. It was all about what was in me and what was instilled in me from my upbringing in the streets. You know, some people like to compare the, the actual street experiences to college, right? Um, I'm in rooms and I was in rooms with very successful people um, before I was an elected official and I'm sitting there and, and I'm talking about CEOs and, and millionaires and billionaires and I'm sitting in the same room with them making decisions and they're trying to figure out what college did I attend? And then once they find out that, oh wow, no, he doesn't have it, they're like, holy, holy cow. You know, so it's all about understanding where you came from and wanting more for yourself and your family and your future. And, and that's, what, that's what drives me. Um, you know, I have two young children, six and seven. Um, they, they, are, they are the future, right? My children and their friends. Mm -hmm, absolutely. Um, and, and it is my job to make sure that their future is bright. And all children, future in the city of Philadelphia, um, future is bright. And I'm willing to do whatever it takes to make sure that the city gets gets back in line. You know, gets uh, we get some structure and proper representation, and we do the people's business the way we are supposed to, the way we swear in. And I like that you talk about work ethic and being self-made, mm -hmm. because in today's day and age, you can really create any business, you can do anything, mm -hmm. and. I think the legalization of a market such as this one would crop up so many opportunities, like the self-made person you, you talked about who's doing delivery to, right to people's doors. The fact that they accomplish that, you know, even without being recognized as a legal business is absolutely incredible to me. So mm -hmm. I really like that you shared that. And I guess my last question about this bill would be, how would you respond to the opposition who might say that weed legalization is a danger to safe driving, to the workplace environment, and in general, just other environments where sobriety would be something considered yeah. important. So, so uh, Senator Regan and I, we are, we are putting together a quality piece, and what makes it quality is that everyone is in the room, right? Every industry that would be impacted, whether it's lab testing, whether it's um, law enforcement, whether it's um, you know, some health agencies or, or therapists, everyone is a part of the conversation. Um, and that's part of the reason why we're slow walking the language because we're meeting with everybody. We're not shutting people out. If, if you're for it or against it, we wanna hear you. We wanna talk to you. We, wanna, we, wanna, we want you to be a part of this process. This is not Senator Regan and I just saying, you know what, this is what we want and this is what it's gonna be. No, it's not what this is. When people reach out or organizations reach out and they voice their opinions, we actually listen. And then we, we take a step back and we say, all right, well, let's look a little bit further into that. We, we, we're looking at every other state that legalized recreational marijuana and we're looking at the hurdles that they faced we're looking at the success stories. We're looking at the failures. We're looking at the lawsuits line by line with a fine tooth comb to make sure that Pennsylvania leads in the cannabis industry um, with a focus point on the social equity component. There's not many states, if any, that have an active social equity component where black people are profiting from the industry. And it is our goal to make sure that Pennsylvania is the first. Of course, we can't make everybody happy, right? Mm -hmm. But we'll make majority of them happy with this, this uh, the way we're structuring this bill. Everyone is going to win. Our main opposition currently right now is the homegrown folks. Uh, in my personal opinion, 
I don't agree with homegrown. I'm not saying that maybe further down the line, after we get a, a bill done, maybe there might be opportunity for amendments. But this is still Pennsylvania, and there's going to be some push and pull, some give and take to get this thing done. You know, as legislators and as advocates, um, you know, people who support the recreational use, we got to look at the bigger picture. And to me, the bigger picture is access to the mm -hmm. industry, to people that were impacted the most, the social equity component, and the decriminalization component. Giving people access to jobs, right, not just in the industry, but clearing their records for nonviolent drug offenses. There was a guy who testified in a hearing who told, on record, and said, I'm a medical marijuana patient. I can legally purchase and consume cannabis. He applied for a job through the city of Philadelphia, made it all the way through, but then they said, oh, well, you smoke marijuana, you're not going to pass the drug test, so we can't hire you. But he's legally really? eligible to smoke. Over medical use of it, too. Absolutely. Wow. So how do we make that make sense? It would yeah. never make sense. So the state says it's legal if you have a medical marijuana card, but then the city says we won't hire you because you're legally eligible to consume cannabis. Crazy. It makes no sense. <laughs> so now mind. this same individual who was about to get a job with a, a, a decent salary, benefits for him and his children, he was denied access because he smokes cannabis, which is legal. Yeah. And so that's just one example of one of the wrongs that we have to fix. And we will be in conversations with the city before anything gets introduced to, to see how and what it will take to make them change their policies and procedures. Because if we sit here and pass recreational use and then we expunge a lot of records for nonviolent drug offenses and our goal is to give black people access to jobs, housing, and government assistance and benefits. We can't have municipalities working against all the work that we're putting in, right? And to me, the people matter most. And when you say municipalities working against, can you clarify what you mean by that? Do you mean city council? Um, which entities yeah, do you so, mean? Yeah, so municipalities, I mean, um, you know, cities that have policies like the one I just mentioned. Yeah. That's working against what we're doing. We're working to get this same individual access, but then the city, whatever department it is, their policies state that if you smoke, you can't work. You see what I'm saying? Yeah, so it's, it's bizarre. Like, yeah, it makes no sense. And so um, that's, that's, um, that's one answer to part of your question. And then the next thing is the driving while impaired. Uh, we've been meeting yeah. with top law enforcement in municipalities, um, DAs of counties, uh, state police to figure out how we can, you know, make sure everyone comes to a, a, a common place, right? We, we all agree. Law enforcement will never 100% agree with it. It is what it is, sure. right? Um, I, know the, I know the countrywide FOP, uh, they're, they're against it nationally. But then you have municipalities and county FOP who say, you know what, free up my guys. We need to focus on violent crime. Yeah. We have DAs in counties, rural counties, 95% Republican counties, 99% white counties who say, I'm not, I'm not filing charges for somebody for smoking marijuana. <laughs> and they throw it out because mm -hmm. in certain areas they want to focus on the, the, the meth labs, the illegal meth labs yeah. in, these, in, these, in their communities. They want to focus on the drug overdoses. They want to focus on the, the aggravated assaults in these white rural counties. You know, so we have some counties like in, in, in Warren County, which is it's the borderline into, before you reach New York State. Mer cannabis is legal in New York. So if, if we have residents of Pennsylvania who live in Warren County, for example, who work in New York State, 
-hmm. and, and if they work in New York State, they might play in New York State. They might want to have a good time in New York State. They might have family and friends in New York. So they do that, and then they come home. And they get pulled over for being intoxicated on marijuana. Now it's, oh, wow, two miles up back up the road, it was legal for me to do it. But once I crossed into Pennsylvania, it's now illegal. So how do you, how do you, how do you try that case? How do you charge somebody when yeah. five minutes ago it was legal for me to do what I was doing to now I can go to jail? So, so there's right. a lot of cases that are not being pursued. But I mean, pursued. I mean, regardless of that, isn't it illegal to drive while intoxicated? So wouldn't the person, shouldn't they get pulled over regardless mm -hmm. of what state they're in? Yeah, so, so there are some studies that have been done, and there's, there's some studies and research and some data being pulled to, to, to see in other states. Did DUIs go up when they, when they legalize recreational use? A lot of states are saying no. Mm -hmm. The facts are the facts. We had we had uh, law enforcement and 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 uh, several different kind of professionals testify in our hearings in Harrisburg that DUIs did not go up in these states. Oh, right. Yeah. And so and so the one the one hurdle that we're trying to get over right now is how do you test to see how high this person is. Or how do we test to see if they can't drive or not? Right. And so once we solidify that and we have a bunch of different tech companies reaching out to us um, with like eye scanner things and, and you know, all kinds of uh, different technology to see what's going to work for law enforcement to, to, to ensure that the people's safety is in, in a good place. Absolutely, and I appreciate that you are putting so much of an emphasis on safety, mm -hmm. even with a bill that seems to many of us to be intuitively, you know, correct and, and logical to us. It's also important to ensure safety of our citizens mm -hmm. on the streets, in the workplace. So I definitely do like that you're doing that. And, and one more point on the safety piece. I'm very heavy on consumer protections, right? And so when we have a a millions of consumers of cannabis, we want to make sure that they're not intaking something that's toxic. Yeah. Right. right? And so there's a lab, which is in, in my district, who tested street weed and medical um, weed, or street cannabis, medical cannabis. And there was a large difference between the two. In the street cannabis, illicit market cannabis, it was uh, two different kinds of fungus found in it. Um, two, wow. two, two types of aspergillus, which can be deadly and has been proven to be connected to loss of life if, it, if consumed. And then we got the medical tested and it came back clean, safe, ready to go, right? And so there's a chance that the street weed or street cannabis is not being, one, controlled, or gr grown in a controlled, regulated environment. Two, test it before it's put out to the consumer. We have to protect the consumers, and we have to make sure that if this thing, if cannabis is going to be made available to everybody, we want to make sure the product is safe, mm -hmm. clean, and that you can wake up the next morning, you know, yeah. after you do your do, your due, whether it's for... <laughs> recreational use, or even uh, to, to, to help ease the pain for your sickness. So consumer protections, um, which is all ties into public safety, is important for Senator Regan and I. Yeah, so I know we spent a lot of time on this topic, but that brings up another question to my mind, which is you're talking about street weed and a lot of these businesses that are currently illegal, mm -hmm. that there's a lot of toxins in the substance yes. they are selling. So how do we go about, if we're bringing these businesses to the legal side of mm -hmm. the market, how do we go about ensuring that they are selling products that aren't dangerous to consumers? Yes, yes. so, so um, in, in, in our language, in our, in our bill, there's a, a, a very structured testing component. Once the cannabis is grown 
in the, in the controlled environment, these companies have to get a third-party tester. We're not doing in-house testing. You have to get a third-party tester okay, yeah. to test the product. Just a snapshot of the process is the testers come in and they'll take random samples from all over, all over your, your, your grower, um, all over wherever, whatever you're growing, and then they test it to make sure that it's safe and that the potency is what it's supposed to be, make sure it is not too high or too low, and then that's when that, that batch is approved and then put into the market. The street cannabis, doing it the way we just mentioned, we're gonna keep people safe and people are going to enjoy the product more and they're gonna be okay with, with buying a quality product because the tax revenue is gonna go to great causes in our state and in our city. You know, so the illicit market, the black market, they're going to be upset for a little while because mm -hmm. what we're planning to do is going to go directly at the black market and hurt their business. It is what it is. But those same individuals have the opportunity to get in the business the right way. Yeah. Right? That's this whole social equity piece. So there's no excuse for people to keep on doing it the wrong way. When I myself, Rep Brown giving you access, black people access to do it the right way. Definitely, and I think that'll give a lot of people more comfort mm -hmm. knowing about this bill and knowing about the effects that it will have, mm -hmm. especially when you're emphasizing safety and you know um, ethical business practices so much. Mm -hmm. I'd like to ask you about where you see the future taking you as a mm -hmm. legislator with fund distribution and infrastructure improvement in Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. And at the end of last year, I know that you secured $11.5 million mm -hmm. in grants towards strengthening the workforce, improving infrastructure, and public health services. So how are you going to go about utilizing these funds for those causes? Yeah, so um, it was uh, well over 11.5, but... Um, Is that so? Yes, 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 yes. <laughs> Amazing. So that was 11.5 in development dollars for the district, um, but you know, we, we, we were also able to get several of the local nonprofits awarded millions of dollars as well. Um, like, like, for example, we were able to secure a $200,000 grant for a, uh, a local nonprofit to uh, award certain um, heavy, um, violent areas with residential doorbell cameras. And so I think we're doing like 220 homes free doorbell cameras and things like that, free installation, all they need is Wi-Fi. And wow. we have several food banks that we started before I was elected, and we make sure they have the funding that they're needed so they can keep on servicing um, the community. We were able to secure some, uh, some renovation dollars for some nonprofits so they can actually have a, a physical structure so then they can build and grow. Just all kinds of opportunities. We were able to get some funds for Fairmount Park. Uh, the Man Music Center, you know, all things Great. that people need the most and that we needed the most during COVID. Only outside yeah. venue space was 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 available to us. Um, you know, I'm a big parks guy. Uh, you know, I'm now looking for money to invest in our local playgrounds and stuff like that uh, because our children, you know, even though it is what it is, our, our parks are not safe right now, but I believe that the, uh, the pendulum is swinging, and our city will be safe. Our communities will be safe, uh, um, and I'm not letting up off of that, you know. And right. so it's while we're going through this, I'm going to find money to invest in, in my community, whether it's playgrounds, community spaces, libraries, public schools, whatever it is. We're going to keep bringing the money to, to my community, to my district, to my city, to make sure that when we get out of this, this pandemic of violence, the city is gonna be prepared for the communities and, and for my constituents to enjoy their communities to where we can live and grow and be safe. And mm -hmm. where our small businesses can stay open later, um, employ more people and things of that nature. So, um, you know, the, the money that I have been able to bring to 
Philadelphia and West Philly has been uh, it, it, it it has been eye opening to a lot of folks, um, and mainly because they're like, how did he do it? And the way that I was able to do it was off of the relationships that I built in Harrisburg, reaching across the aisle, uh, uh, you know, working with Republicans, working with independents and whoever right. it is. You know, I don't see party, right? I see issues and problems in my community. And then in Harrisburg, I see people that can help me either soften the blow or help change what's going on in my community. So if, okay. if I believe, if we say this is the problem, I take a step back and evaluate who in Harrisburg or who in D.C. or who in city council, who do I need to build a relationship with to make sure I solve this problem? And if money right. was the problem, then who do you get close to? The money people. Who controls the state? The Republicans, right? So I don't see party. It's, I see issues in my community. I figure out a path to victory, yeah. a path to the resources, no matter what it takes to get it done. And I have been delivering. And I plan to continue to do that, um, deliver for my community. I'm always going to be willing to stand on the X and take the hits and take the blows because at the end of the day, I'm going to deliver. You know, that's, yeah. what, that's what my community sent me to Harrisburg to do. And wherever they send me in the future, whether it's, uh, I don't know, um, whether it's the D.C. or City Hall, wherever it is, um, or if, it's, if my community wants me to stay in Harrisburg, wherever they send me, I'm going to do whatever it takes to make sure that we're progressing. Yeah, and I like that you talk about reaching over party lines mm -hmm. and avoiding the petty political conflicts that sometimes just yes. are so characterized mm -hmm. in our media all the time yes. in local government. Mm -hmm. But I think, I think it all just goes back to your point about improving access and mm -hmm. giving people the opportunities to live in a safe community, mm -hmm. having kids go and feel free to play in the parks and yes. just enjoy their lives like you know the children mm -hmm. they should be. Yeah. You know. and, and, and trust and believe those days are coming. Yeah. You know, um, like I said, the pendulum is swinging. We have we have people that are currently in leadership uh, who who they're doing they're making some the right decisions to make sure that we have people around us that all think alike and who have the the community's interests and puts the people first, right? Um, and and that involves working with private investment working with the community, working with law enforcement, working with developers, working with city council, working with the land bank. You know, uh, once we address all of the obvious issues, public safety, housing, education, and just quality of life. Yeah. Once we address those, this city can, it can, we can, we can be a leader in this country um, and, and so on so many different levels. And that's my goal for our city. It's making sure that we're not just, oh, that's just Philadelphia. No, we need to be the leaders in what we know, what I know that we can lead in. We can, we can, we can lead in technology. We can lead in life sciences. Hell, they created the vaccine on 37th and Market. Yeah, right in my district, right? And we need to build on that, give access to black people, give access to, give, give a lot of these life sciences jobs, these, these life sustaining wages, family sustaining wages, um, and, and bring back trainings, training facilities, train my community in this space so we can get access to these jobs. It shouldn't be people from Jersey or people from Virginia moving to Philly getting the jobs, we have qualified people here. Yep. And it's my job to make sure people like me have access to the education that they need, it, that they need or the training that's needed so we can get those jobs, right? So when yeah. I'm in rooms with developers or investors, I'm speaking for my community. And it's like, okay, I get it. You wanna put this building up, but we wanna be the first ones in. 
Right. We, we want to be the first ones digging a hole in the ground, the first ones pouring the concrete, the first ones putting up the steel. We want access to all those jobs. And then once this building is up and running, we want access to these high quality paying, these high paying jobs, these quality jobs. So why is being built? Send some of my people to a training facility. Give, give some of the people from my community internships. Um, let's bring in some of my high school students, whether yeah. they're in a public school or a charter school. Let's, let's give them access to your labs and train them and see if this is something that they're, they'll be interested in. Yeah, and I think that's something that's definitely going to be on the forefront of everyone's minds after mm -hmm. watching this, giving the people in our communities the opportunities to flourish yes. and make this city a pioneer of social mm -hmm. equity. Yes. That would be amazing. And thank you so much for all of your insights. Everything that you've shared today has been so valuable, and I really appreciate having you on. Thank you so much. No, thank you. I appreciate the opportunity. Be sure to check out Inside Ambitions YouTube where you can see more videos and interviews just like this and check us out on Instagram at inside underscore ambition. As always, we're so glad that you tuned in and thanks for watching. We'll see you on the next one.